Following the road north from Lexington, it eventually splits. One part goes northeast towards Concord, and the other part goes northwest. If instead of following either split in the road, we continue straight through the grass, we eventually stumble upon a large transmission tower. This electricity pylon is part of some pre-war power lines that stretched all the way from the northern portion of the map through Abernathy Farm, ending in Lexington, right on the Mystic River. It's unlikely that these transmission lines still convey electricity, considering the homestead of Abernathy Farm is built right in the tower. At any rate, just north of this transmission tower, we see a big, rickety old green shack. This is Gorski Cabin. What at first looks like an unremarkable feature. Just another run-down pre-war shack littering the landscape. Complete with molding, ripped furniture lying on the deck. But going around back, we spy something interesting. Right next to a rusting blue picker-up truck, we see an exhaust pipe of some sort sticking out of the ground. What is this doing back here? This has got to be some sort of air ventilation system for an underground structure, which means that Gorski's cabin may hide more secrets than it at first lets on. Now that the cabin has caught our attention, we can creep up onto the deck. Peering through the front window, we see a ghoul sleeping on a mattress. And no time for questions. We don't need to know his name. There is only one fate for such creatures. Heading inside, we find a sparsely decorated cabin. Against the southwestern wall, we see a table with a few stools and some random kitchenware. I wonder how long this feral ghoul has been sleeping here. Years, possibly even centuries. Against the northern wall, we see a chem station. This is an odd thing to find in an abandoned shack, but I suppose this chemistry station could have been dragged here at any point during the past 200 years. On a coffee table, we see one piece of jet, and right next to it, we find a hatch that leads to a root cellar. The first thing we notice in this root cellar is all of the power lines stretching from the hatch along the ceiling of this subterranean chamber. Despite the power lines, it's lit by nothing more than an oil lamp in the corner. We find rusting shelves against one wall, lots of boxes, and a small assortment of tools. There's one ammo container sitting on top of some crates, a refrigerator, and then in one corner we find the food stockpile, some cans of cram, purified water, and other empty cans. There's also a bathtub here, complete with a toaster inside. Thankfully, no skeleton here. And then a weapons workbench. Okay, so this underground area was used as a workshop. Continuing through the tunnel, we begin to see some sewage piping and ventilation shafts. They crawl along the ground and creep along the ceiling right next to those power cables. The pipes, cables, and shafts all end at one big concrete structure to the southwest. Here we see a big leaky faucet right next to a toilet in one corner and a still functional radio. The door is not locked and we never know what's gonna be on the other side of these things, so we open it with caution. And that looks like it was about it. We find one standing feral ghoul and his name is Wayne Gorski. We should make sure nobody ever finishes building this. Building what, X6? And then we see it. Against the southwestern wall, we see a workbench covered in tools. There was a plaque against the wall, but we can't interact with it. No idea what it at one time said, and it's also strange to see a plaque in an underground bunker. Taking a look at the workbench, we can loot some turpentine, and then we see a disassembled mini-nuke. Two mini-nuke beryllium caps with an alarm clock, a mini-nuke detonator shell, a mini-nuke hemisphere core, some duct tape, and some mini-nuke stabilizer fens. This guy had somehow gotten his hands on a mini-nuke and had been disassembling it. But for what purpose? Here we find evidence for what turned Wayne Gorski into a feral. We see two big barrels of toxic nuclear waste in a corner. Of course, it might have been the contents of the mini-nuke that turned him feral as well. And it must have acted quickly, because it's not like he was locked in this room. He was in the middle of a project, working on disassembling this mini-nuke, when, due to radiation exposure, his 
feral nature took over. Without any enemies in sight, no prey to attack, he stood here motionless for two hundred years. Turning around and looking east, we see a terminal on a desk. And right next to the terminal is none other than our favorite periodical, The Wasteland Survival Guide. This one is the Guide to Diamond City, a road leading through so many graves. This magazine does nothing more than mark Diamond City on our map. Fine during the early portion of the game, but pretty useless later on. We find a bottle cap mine on the desk, and the terminal is locked with a novice lock. After hacking the terminal, we read it, and there's only one entry. Statement of intent. Personal terminal of Wayne Gorski. This will be my first and only entry. I identify myself as a free-thinking citizen of these once great United States. I will not stand idly by as the government infects the minds of its people with devices like the electrical tower they've erected in my front lawn. I pledge to take down this mind control device by any means necessary and have begun construction of an incendiary device. If you are reading this, I have certainly been killed or detained in a government interrogation camp. The news will surely warp the truth and brand me a communist traitor. Do not believe their lies. Let all true patriots know that what I do, I do of my own free will and for the good of my country. So Wayne Gorski was trying to make an incendiary device to blow up the big transmission tower in his front lawn. He thought that it was erected by the US government as a mind control device. While Mr. Gorski was never placed in any American concentration camps and no one ever accused him of being a commie, no, he was ultimately the architect of his own fate. He turned himself into a ghoul likely by accident. Well, what lessons can we walk away with after hearing the story of Wayne Gorski? Well, most notably is I think that Wayne Gorski is a reference to Ted Kaczynski. They have many things in common. Many of you will recognize Ted Kaczynski as the true identity of the Unabomber. The Unabomber was a domestic terrorist in the United States who was active between 1978 and 1995. He became infamous over those nearly two decades for killing three people and injuring 23 others by sending his victims homemade bombs through the mail. These are two points that Wayne Gorski and Ted Kaczynski share in common right off the bat. First, they both have Polish names, Kaczynski, Gorski. And they both were trying to make bombs. The difference is in their purpose. Wayne Gorski was an eccentric who wasn't trying to kill anybody, but was instead trying to destroy transmission towers. But Ted Kaczynski made makeshift bombs with the purposeful intent of killing people who in any way were related to technology. The core tenet of his world philosophy was that the Industrial Revolution was a disaster for the human race. He argued that technology had a destabilizing effect on society, made life unfulfilling, and caused widespread psychological suffering. He thought that because of technology, people ended up spending their lives on useless pursuits, careers, TV shows, gossip magazines. He called these things surrogate activities, wherein people strove towards artificial goals. It sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Who do we know who's obsessed with technology? That's right, none other than the Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood of Steel, however, are slightly different. They believe that technology in the wrong hands is the problem. And so they go out of their way to discover, collect, and hoard technology, and then to not share it with others. Ted Kaczynski targeted people whom he believed were responsible for using technology or reaching the most people with technology. Some of the many people whom he sent bombs to include the president of United Airlines at the time, an engineering professor, Professor, a psychology professor, a geneticist, a computer science professor, an advertising executive, and even two computer store owners. These guys just owned shops that sold computer equipment. Because computers were technology, they were both victims, one of whom died. Wayne Gorski and Ted Kaczynski also isolated themselves from society. Ted Kaczynski had a PhD in mathematics and became a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, where he taught undergrad courses in geometry and calculus. After only two years, he abruptly resigned and retired to a remote cabin in Montana. 
There he began to work on his world philosophy, and he developed his manifesto, which he called the Industrial Society and its Future. He valued direct contact with what he called wild nature, and indeed after his arrest and incarceration, he says that one of his greatest fears is that he would begin to lose his memories of the mountains and the woods of Montana. Nature ended up being a big theme in many of his crimes. Not only did he make his homemade bombs with wood parts, sometimes even putting tree bark in his bombs, but many of his targets were specifically chosen because they had a passing reference to wood. The last names of two of his victims were Wood and Moss, er... One of his victims was a timber industry lobbyist. Kaczynski and Gorski share another theme in common, in that they were both inspired to create their bombs after witnessing what the government did to the nature around them. Wayne Gorski decided to make his bomb after the government erected a transmission tower in his front yard, and Kaczynski originally intended to live in Montana peacefully. He only decided to start making bombs after he watched the wild land around his cabin start to get developed by real estate companies and other industrial projects. He started by just simply trying to sabotage these people, but after that didn't change anything, he decided to start making bombs. He recalled the moment where he snapped. He had a favorite place where he would go to soak up nature. It was a rolling landscape in Montana where you could find ravines that cut steeply into cliff-like drop-offs. There was a waterfall there that was his particular favorite. It was about a two days hike away from his cabin. One day in the summer of 1983, he was starting to get annoyed by a lot of the tourists that had begun to camp in the land around his cabin. So to get some peace and quiet, he went on a two-day hike to the spot by the waterfall that he remembered. Only when he got there, he discovered that the government had placed a road right through it. He says, You can't imagine how upset I was. It was from that point on that I decided that, rather than trying to acquire further wilderness skills... I would work on getting back at the system. Revenge. This account of his is slightly inconsistent with historical events because he's recalling something that happened in 1983 as being the impetus of his terrorist campaign, but the very first mail bomb he sent was in 1978, five years before his favorite nature spot was destroyed. But while I think the parallels between Gorski and Kaczynski are there, at least Gorski wasn't trying to murder people. Yes, he was trying to destroy an electrical tower, which itself is pretty messed up, but it probably wouldn't have resulted in any deaths. I think this is also another great example of how pre-war people thought before the bombs dropped. Gorski described himself as being a, quote, free-thinking citizen of these once great United States. There's a whole lot in that statement. He's saying that the United States used to be great, but something has happened that makes it no longer great. And he distinguishes himself from everyone else in the country by describing himself as free thinking while everyone else was not. He also expresses his paranoia at the U.S. government, worried that the government would kidnap him and put him in an interrogation camp, worried that he would be branded a communist traitor. Now, we already know from elsewhere in Fallout lore that the United States did indeed have Chinese-American concentration camps, where they rounded up American citizens of Chinese descent, like the Wu family, for fear of them being communist traitors. I wonder how many other Americans, like Wayne Gorski here, was afraid of that same fate happening to him. But he was also a bit unhinged. Instead of recognizing an electrical tower for what it is, he thought that it was a mind control device and that the government was trying to control the minds of its people through that transmission tower. So, Gorski may not have been the murderous sort of crazy that Kaczynski was, but he was certainly his own form of crazy. Gorski Cabin is an interesting location in that it's one of the very first places you'll likely stumble upon in your playthrough. It's just south of Concord, so as you leave the Museum of Freedom, you stumble right into it. Because of this, most companions in the game, like X688 here, are scripted to have something unique to say when they see the disassembled mini-nuke on the desk. I'm frankly surprised that most companions are as shocked by what they see since they are living in a world where mini nukes are not exactly rare. I mean, yes, they are one of the most rare types of ammunition, but even raiders in downtown Lexington can wield fat men with mini nukes. At any rate, it's a fun encounter and I can't help but pity poor Wayne Gorski and his ultimate fate. But what about you? Did you stumble upon Gorski Cabin in your gameplay? Did you see the air vents near to the cabin? Or did you miss the hatches? 
entirely? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week, so if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a lot of great content coming up, ladies and gents. I've been working really hard this week on capturing footage for a big series I'm going to be doing on Honest Hearts. I announced it during my show yesterday, and I'm really excited to get that content done for you. I've got a t-shirt shop, folks. If you would like an Oxhorn or a Fallout-inspired shirt, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.